not going to spend a, a Candace has done just a, a wonderful job and ta uh, uh, yesterday uh, an, an, another good presentation by Al so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on some of the pharmacology I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about some of the techniques and the and um, some of the modalities and some of the, some of the things that I think as you as perfusionists uh, I will tell you again, I believe I think you underestimate your role in the overall outcome of a patient, not only just in the management of cardiopulmonary bypass, but also in protection of the heart. Um, cardiac surgery, from my perspective, and I think from many of yours, is a team sport and requires communication between everyone. So. Um, <clears throat> I'll get going and quit wandering. By the way, uh, just to, Candace, you, you pointed out about lidocaine, I'll, I'll give you just one little tiny uh, pharmacological hint about uh, the single dose solutions outside of custodial. All of the Del Nido, modified Del Nido and the KBC. All, all of you, your heart currently works very effectively because you use the sodium potassium pump. Uh, lidocaine is the most effective sodium channel blocker that we have. And there are numerous sodium channels on the cell membrane. It, it's a long acting. And so it's very, very effective uh, at binding at those sites and blocking the sodium channels. But there are two other entry points for uh, calcium into the cell that can cause the cell to move. And those are the uh, fast and the slow channels. Well, guess what? The most effective fast and slow channel blocker that we know is magnesium sulfate. So within these single dose type solutions, you have two excellent uh, uh, ions that, that work very effectively at the cell membrane. When you add to that um, a hyperkalemic arrest of potassium uh, in the extracellular space, now you have the ability to arrest the heart and pharmacologically keep it quiet. What we're going to talk about are some of the other factors that can affect that, and, and I'm going to ask you the question now, and we'll ask it again later. Just because the heart's quiet doesn't mean it's protected. So um, this is kind of a picture of who we are, where we are. We're about 18, 17 years into the MPS, and we have about 400-plus centers and over 100,000 procedures in the United States. So. Our goal as a, as a myocardial protection company is to help drive the science. What I do is I do clinical research, I speak, um, I work clinically in the operating room. We have some very interesting things going on in laboratories, um, looking at, at a number of things, and I think that those things will play out, maybe not in my clinical lifetime, but certainly in many of yours. One of the, the things that uh, uh, we still face today, <clears throat> this is from 2008, it's from the expedition trial. Uh, many of you, um, your centers were in this trial. What's interesting about that is there was, th this is the control group that you see right here. And what you see right here is death. You don't see death up there because death was less than one half percent. But what it showed was that with your base myocardial protection strategy and the surgical techniques that were used, which are pretty much still quite common today, look how we hurt the heart, okay? Elective cabbage, almost one out of five. Ejection fraction less than 35%, one out of five. Three vessel disease, one out of five. Blood cardioplegia, supposedly the gold standard. One out of four patients. They didn't die, but we hurt their heart, okay? Why is that? Was it because of technical thing? Was it because of poor uh, surgery? I doubt it, you can't, you don't get poor surgery at UPMC or Stanford or New York or other places like that. This was presented by Hartzell Shaft, 2005. Now, since then, 
we, the more uh, the morbidity, the acuity of our patients has, has increased exponentially. It's probably 50 or 60 percent higher, but that yet these two numbers are the same. Mortality, for the most part, is not our problem. This is where our opportunity is. And again, I'll ask you the question, does lack of activity mean the heart's not protected? You, I'm not going to spend much time here. Within my, the microplegia arm, we include uh, the different ratio cardioplegias, because some of you still use ratio cardioplegia. But in every case that you do, in every disease pathology, it always goes through my mind. What, where are we, what are we trying to do? We're trying to protect the myocyte and endothelium. You can't lose sight of what we're really doing, okay? Um, and you'll see a little bit more in a minute. All I want to tell you was this is, I don't know what you do. You could do microplegia, you could do custodial, you can use traditional del nido, you can use a ratio of cardioplegia, but what have you heard today? What did Candace emphasize? That surgeons want to, want to operate <clears throat> and they want to be hands-free. They want to be, not have the interruption of, of having to stop and redose the heart. Well, the beauty of the MPS is no matter what you do, you can be hands-free. You can hook them up, you can hook this up, one of these two up to an octopus if you want, and you drive the bus. All your, sur your surgeon never has to stop. All he needs to do is tell you whether he wants anti-grade or retrograde, and you can deliver it. And during that delivery, you have control over the pressure, the flow, the temperature, the pharmacology, all of those things that mean something. So rather than talk about pharmacology, we're going to visit a few of these things. <clears throat> now, when it comes to single-dose cardioplegia, one of the things that kind of puzzles me a little bit, and we've seen a change in the last three or four years. Now, Candace's institution is a little different. But when, as we were coming along with traditional cardioplegia, most of us gave antegrade, and then Dr. Buckberg came along and did retrograde and taught us about integrated cardioplegia and showed us, and then Dr. Weisel did, and Dr. Guyton did, and then some groups in Europe showed us that integrated cardioplegia was the best. But then when we went to single dose, that we're, now we're doing valvular surgery, or aortic surgery, where patients have hypertrophied hearts, the, dot, the geometry of their hearts changed, we went back to giving just integrate. Well, that's changing, I'll show you. Temperature. Dr. Del Nido, Dr. Pedro Del Nido is a, is a long, long time friend. When he does pediatrics, he cools every patient to 24. He tapes and ties all um, uh, intracardiac connections. So he can go 60 or 90 minutes and the heart's still cold. How many of you cool at all? Most of you drift, right? Most of the time you're 34 <clears throat> degrees or so. You don't isolate the heart. You use a two-stage or three-stage venous cannula. Even if you use two uh, inferior superior vena cable cannulation, you don't tie the tapes down very often. So what happens? 34 degree blood is coming back into the heart. Then you have the, all the different disease pathologies. The concept of one size fits all is great, but as Candace already showed you, and we're beginning to see in other things, our ability to treat each patient as, and their own disease pathology, along with the technical repairs at, uh, of that surgical team and their, their experience with that repair means something as far as ischemic time. Their atherosclerotic load. You, when you first heard about Del Nido, used in uh, adult patients, most everyone said, oh, we don't do um, cabbage patients with Del Nido. Why? Because you wash it out, okay? But how many of our patients that we do have a atherosclerotic load? So if you add pulmonary disease and you add an atherosclerotic load, coronary collaterals, and then you add cannulation, 
you may have changed the dynamics. You are sitting back at the pump. You're the only one that has access to that information. You're looking at the vent. You're looking at everything else. What is the expected cross clamp? Okay, and this is where our this is where our team sport becomes really really important. You have a surgeon that wants to go from a multi-dose to a single-dose cardioplegia, and his typical cross clamp for an aortic valve is 75 to 90 minutes, and he wants to give just one dose. What do you? you better be prepared to give her a second dose. You better have that conversation at the very beginning of the operation, okay? Because if it changes any at all, you've got to be prepared. You can't think that he's going to be any faster. In all the data that's been published on single-dose cardioplegia, okay, only one center has shown a shortage in cross-clamp. In fact, if you look at Al's data from yesterday through specialty care, there was no difference in cross-clamp and plan for any intraoperative changes. So I'm just going to ask a couple of quick questions here. Think about what you do and how you do it. Is it possible for you looking at what you do and opportunity to make a change or, or perceive a change, can you improve the early recovery of myocardial metabolism? In other words, how long does it take for the heart to make and use ATP postoperatively? If you can answer this one question right here, if you could improve this one thing right here, your hospital would double your salary. You know why? Because as soon as the heart is able to make and utilize ATP effectively, you no longer need a swan, you no longer, no longer need, to, need inotropes, you no longer be in the ICU, you can go to the, you can go to the floor. And in most of our places, if you get out of the ICU six hours earlier, eight hours earlier, that's a six to ten thousand dollar savings to the hospital. So, if you could just focus on that one question, so I'm sorry, you would do better. But can you restore better LV function? Can you reduce hemodilution? All of these things. But the bottom line always comes down in our society and our healthcare system: can these reduce costs? Will a change in strategy reduce costs? But for you and I as clinicians, we answer the other question as well. Do these changes improve patient outcomes? Okay? So <clears throat> I would, if I asked this question here, I don't think you guys would be very happy with the response that we saw. How do you currently assess the quality of your myocardial protection? I can pretty well tell most of you it's all after the horse is out of the barn, right? How do you assess it intraoperatively? Most of the time we use metabolic measurements post-op. Some of us may draw lactates, but we never draw coronary sinus lactates, okay? But what we do is we measure troponin I, we measure CKMB, we, we look at for new Q waves, we do other things, we look at ischemic time, According to the STS database, if you look at 80 to 90 minutes and you look at, at myocardial dysfunction, when you hit that point, the curve goes like this. And that's millions of cases, all comers. So when you think about an intra-op single dose method, <clears throat> you heard Candace just a minute, Ty asked the question a minute ago, you look up there and the ECG begins to move. Is that the best way to assess that? How many times have you been in a case and you look up there and um, ECG is flat and the surgeon says the heart's moving? Okay. In many of the minimally invasive cases and other things, we move the leads around. So is that really an accurate representation of, of assessment? This, to me right now, this and the esophageal temp probe are two good ones. If you use esophageal temp probe and you put it in there and the esophageal temp probe <coughs> at, at 40 minutes is reading 27, 28 degrees, that's the temperature of the heart, okay? Transesophageal echo, when the anesthesiologist decides to leave the room and go have barbecue and watch CNBC, okay? Have him turn 
the echo machine towards you and leave the echo on. Because in your minimally invasive cases and many other cases where the surgeon cannot see the heart, he's only working through a small incision here, you look up there and you can see if the heart is moving. Okay, you may not be able to see it any other way, but you can see it there. I put this here to tell you a story. When I was in New York uh, earlier uh, or last, la late last spring, doing one, doing an evaluation in one of the biggest centers, they have two very well known, very well respected and published um, surgeons that do aortic surgery and aortic valve surgery. So while in this of course of the evaluation, they went from traditional del nido to microplegia del nido. And so what I did was I just took the temperatures and for the traditional del nido, and then I did 20 cases, 10 with each guy, and then I did 10 cases of microplegia del nido, okay? All patients arrested, um, giving antigrade, about 50% of the patients were given antigrade and retrograde with a maximum dose of 1,500 mils. The, the myocardial temp for all patients was uh, between 10 and 11 and a half degrees. Okay? So at 20 minutes, we had them put temperature probes in the anterior and posterior septum. At 20 minutes, the, temp the temperature of the heart was the ambient temperature of the room. At 30 minutes, it was around 23 degrees. At 40 minutes, it was 25 degrees. 50 minutes, 27 degrees. And at 60 minutes, 28 and a half to 29 and a half degrees. Now, 100% of these patients were pharma pharmacologically, we had done the job. The hearts did not move. They did not move. So I asked the question. You have information. Knowledge is power. So I asked the question, just because the heart stopped doesn't mean it's protected. They looked at me sideways a little bit. Then I asked them, is the metabolic environment adequate to prevent damage to the mycite and the endothelium? And their response to me was, no, probably not. Okay? This is just FYI. Okay? I know people go much longer. And this is a very small subset. Okay, but it does show you what happens in a single dose environment, regardless of whether it's traditional or microplegia del nido. So, when we think about del nido, if you look at the literature, this is how it's currently delivered. One to four, four to one, eight to one, and all blood. Some alter the drug concentration as well. So that's two variables. Same name, two variables. What is the correct dose? Some give one liter, some give a liter and a half, some give 15 mils per liter, some give two liters. Third variable. Some give it only antigrade, most give it antigrade and retrograde, some give it just retrograde. Fourth variable. Some redose here. In fact, I do a talk at the 21st Century Cardiac Surgery Meeting that has 75 young up-and-coming surgeons that are chiefs, are going to be chiefs in, in Los Angeles, in New York, in Cleveland, in Boston, in Berlin, and all these places. And over the last three years, their redosing has gone from here to over 50% of them down in this range. Um, um, less than 30% redosed up in here. But when you redose, Candace said, and I think they have the best approach when it comes to redosing or figuring the dose and redosing. What solution did you use? Some used half dose, a half strength Del Nido. Some used full strength Del Nido. Some went back to their traditional blood cardioplegia. What volume did they give? Again, some based it on time. Some said 200, some said 500, some said 700. So that's the fifth variable, sixth variable, seventh variable. But they all use one name. That's inappropriate. 
okay? I know Al's talk and Candace showed you that there's so many ways to do things, but if we're going to do things differently, we should appropriately name them. And we should, we should be cognizant of those differences and the impacts that they have. It's not just the juice, it's the technique. It's the surgical pathology. It's how it's used and how it's assessed. If, what's the difference? If you give a liter and a half dose of each one of these, you give that much crystalloid and that much blood. It's that simple. Same drugs. So my question to you, is the magic in the drugs or is the magic in the water? Okay? So. Again, I'm not going to spend much time here because we've talked about all this, but I certainly hope that one of the things you leave with today is when you think about what's your flow. Well, you know, I ask people, do you, when you deliver your cardioplegia, what's more important to you? Is it the pressure you go or is it the flow? Most people will say pressure, but then I get varying pressure ranges from 180 to 350 system pressure, very few people measure root pressure so they don't know it anymore. But it, it just amazes me when we do bad hearts, we do hypertroph hypertrophic hearts, that we would pump them, we would give the cardioplegia at the same pressure as we would a normal ventricle. When we know that with a hypertrophied heart, it takes a higher pressure to do that. All of these things, remember we talked about effect the ability, to your arrest, and, and, cardio, and, and protection. Cannulation, vent return, coronary artery disease, temp, the disease pathologies. Again, I won't spend much time there. This was just, came out a week ago, okay? It's a very small uh, experience at uh, North Shore, Del Nido, traditional, microplegia Del Nido, and this is what they showed, again, not, not many patients, an improvement in extubation, ICU stay, hemodilution, transfusion, and ultrafiltration. What does that mean? I don't know. It's too small a patient population to tell you. But it's information for you to take in the process, okay, that there are other ways to do things and maybe better ways to manage your patients. How do you do it? This is, uh, Candace had a very eloquent slide. And I'm, uh, I'm from South Louisiana, so I'm not that smart. So I had to put it up like this. This is how you, what you put in your additive pouch. This is what you put in your rest pouch. You get to choose whether you want to use all blood or whatever. You can deliver whatever you want. You can, you can refill it with Del Nido again. You can KBC your traditional cardioplegia, and then reanimate the heart. Here's, for all of you that want to know about costs, this center, and I was talking to you about New York, used four to one in traditional Del Nido, about 2,000 cases. Their cost savings just by eliminating the solutions alone per year came to $475,000. This is what it costs. KBC is around the same thing. Okay, whatever form of, of single dose Del Nido that you want, around the same thing. Microplegias are about a half of that. This is a NIV ad from Fairfax. This was his article in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery last April. Is it ready for prime time in adult surgery? He wrote this editorial after the publication in the same article of the Cleveland Clinic and their experience over 200 aortic valves. This was Mick and colleagues. And his comments were very good. The authors were careful in their conclusion not to ascribe causality to their results. The importance of the study's limitations lies in their ability to guide us to the next steps. We do not have prospective randomized trials in single dose cardioplegia outside of what Brian talked about, custodial. 
any type of Del Nido or KBC or modified Del Nido, there are no prospective randomized trials. We, we need to look at all the preoperative variables, intraoperative changes in techniques and postoperative care. <clears throat> and we've got to look at a number of parameters to help us def to define what is the success. I'll ask, I'll ask you this. All of you, I'm sure, have made some changes, big or small, in your myocardial protection strategy over the last year or year and a half. How many of you actually go to ICU and see the outcome of what you did? Very good. How do you know you did the right thing? How do you know your assessment was good? How do you know all of these things unless you go look? That's our responsibility. We're professionals. We should do that. This is old, 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 older than me. Recovery of myocardial post-op function is directly related to the metabolic state at the cell membrane and the subcellular level when you take the clamp off. You learn that in Perfusion 101. Stunning is caused by all of these things. But the big factor that we don't know about in single-dose cardioplegia is here. All of these factors play a role in the initiation of molecular changes or changes in phenotype, responsible for, for altered phenotype and long-term reduced contractility, depressed myocardial, and sarcoplasmic reticulum function. What that means is we did a great operation we repaired their valve, we sent them home. A year later, when they come back for their post-op echo, the, the cardiologist calls the surgeon and says, valve looks great, why is the ventricle not working so well? In my travels and speaking around the world and places I'm doing research, I've heard this more and more, but I think it's because of this chaos, as Al described it yesterday, in how we deliver cardioplegia and how we assess it. Is there a difference between the short-term post, short post-op function and single dose and intermittent dose? Well, I don't know. I don't think so, but we definitely don't know here. But again, do you go look? Okay. I'm not going to spend time here. This is Candace's uh, <laughs> Uh, acronym and she did a much better job than I did. I'm going to talk a little bit about microplegia. You know what that is? It's just giving blood in the drugs and this I think we have enough solid evidence and it will come up to uh, a much higher level of evidence in the next update that mi that microplegia does improve distribution in the myocardium and <coughs> This is one of the reasons, because you don't get edema. If, I, if, I, if you whack your arm and your arm swells, you can still use your arm. It's just not as effective. At the end of the cross clamp, I did it for years. You take the cross clamp off four to one, it still beats. But does it have the same contractile strength? Does it, uh, is it as responsive to those hormonal neuronal stimuli? No, probably not, because it's edematous. Does cutting out the water make a difference in patient outcome? Here's one center, 200 cases, 100 in each group. I'm sorry. And that was the cost savings. Again, this is from Verona, Italy. 80 patients came to the OR uh, with unstable angina. The most impressive thing to me is this the significant reduction in troponin and lactate. It does show an improvement in distribution. The wall motion score index, better pump function, reduced need for inotropes. And one of the things, if you get good distribution, you are going to save more ATP, and ATP is very effective in having the heart beat and not needing inotropes and going to the floor. So this is Dr. Tyrone David's evidence, 4,000 patients, 8 to 1, reduced edema, better buffering, better reduction of function, and here you go. The last, my last slide, 
second to last slide, I'm sorry. This is going to be presented at the AETS next month. It'll be, it'll be in the big pharmacology meeting in Boston in May. We went to 93 hospitals over this time. We looked at CV procedures. There were over 250,000 patients included in this study. So we don't, the other, the other group here that's non-MPS is mostly four to one, there's some eight to one, there's some one to one, but in that big a group we found significant reduction in adverse events, ICU length of stay, hospital costs and medication costs. They adjusted the dollars to 215. I can't tell you any more than that. The paper will be out in the next month, but you see those four dollar signs right there? That, that represents what the savings was overall in these 93 hospitals per patient. So last thing, <clears throat> this is a, just a peek inside because there were some qu people asked questions about this. This is the water circulation system. That's the water circulation pump. There's the water circulation valve. You can see the amount of tubing is minimal. We have a lot of people ask us about the NTM and how we deal with it. It's very simple. We have an integrated heater and cooling with an ice bucket. You can hook it to your heater cooler if you want. No sweat, no problem. But if you're trying to not uh, deal with the NTM issue, um, you have an alternative. Every case that you do, when you put your ice in it, you use it, you drain it out, it's ready for the next case, you've turned the water over 80% of the water in the case. So by the time you do it the second, you, you're, it's almost always gone. Because we use ice, because it's such a small, compact system, it's actually, you can get it colder than your heater cooler because you've got all this dead space in that tubing. There is no aerosolization because the system, the water system is encased in a shroud and the fan has no connection to that system. You can use a single chamber heater cooler and an EMPS for cardioplegia at about 50% of the cost of a dual heater cooler. <laughs> we took the, at the FDA's um, assistant, with their assistance, we took what they put out, the cleaning protocols and solutions, we went and we verified and validated to their standards that you can clean the MPS, you put your water in it, you put your whatever solution you choose that's recommended, and, excuse me, um, and you push a button, and 20 minutes later it's clean, you drain the water, you rinse it, you fill it, and it's done. So, um, if you have the MPS and it's hooked to a 3T heater cooler or any other heater cooler, we have verified and validated using the FDA and CDC standards. You can put your cleaning solution in, in your heater cooler, put your cleaning solution in the MPS, push the clean button on both of them, and you can clean them together. Rinse them, drain them. So it's very simple and easy, but this shows you that the MPS separate of that is very easy and very effective to use. And I thank you very much.